Um, welcome to another virtual artist talk, Art for Lunch, from the Art Center in Corvallis. Um, this time we're talking with a group of artists that really submitted a coherent idea for an exhibit and called it Vessel. Uh, the exhibit is open today through uh, February 9th. And uh, our opening hours, I'm excited to say, are Tuesday through Saturday, our regular hours from noon to 5 p.m. Uh, we will have this artist talk virtually, unfortunately, due to the uh, virus I can't pronounce, um, we will not have an in-person reception. We all want you to not get sick uh, and we ourselves don't want to get sick to boot. Um, the car is happening though, and um, that will be on January 20 from four to eight. I would like to welcome um, the artists and um, it's going to be alphabetical because why not? Uh, John Holdway, this is sort of clear who that is. Uh, Envy Moran, wave. Alana Risse, uh, Rhonda Vanover, and Brenda Whitehill. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Um, you have a lovely background with your outfits. It's really <laughs> <laughs> quite lovely. So this is a little bit of an unusual exhibit because um, this proposal came as a group and was accepted as a group. And quite often that doesn't happen. And uh, uh, Victoria, MV Moran, uh, she sent the proposal to uh, myself and the exhibition committee. Uh, you see a work of hers behind me and behind herself. But anyway, um, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit about how this group came together? Sure, that sounds really good. Um, I'm Envy Moran. If you meet me out there in the real world, feel free to call me Victoria. So I I met Rhonda, Brenda, and Alana at PNCA. We were all in the low residency program at different graduate dates, but we were all there pretty much at the same time. I think Rhonda had graduated before Brenda got there, but um, we met there. We um, work really well together. We seem to communicate really well together, and we've shown a handful of times, and it's went really well. So then I met John and Eugene. I actually used to work with his wife in financial aid at the University of Oregon. And John Holdway is this very prolific popular artist in Eugene who I wanted to grow up and be like. So I decided that I was gonna go off to art school. And John has just been a really um, positive influence. And so I thought, you know, John's just such a great guy. We need, you know, a guy in this in this um, proposal. And John was like, "Yes, I absolutely." And so we kind of moved forward with this idea of the body. And so I reached out to them and asked them, "How do you see the body? How does the body um, reflect in your work?" And so we we communicated together. We had these ideas. We brainstormed, and everyone kind of sent in their own idea of how they viewed the body. And it was so similar that it was really easy for me to write up the proposal. And um, it was, it, was this uh, a series of getting togethers with the idea of we're going to put together a, a show or was this general artists talking about their work getting together? I think it was a combination of both. So um, a lot of times I'll be texting or Zooming with others. They'll say something, I will meet up with someone and they'll say something similar. And then I just reached out. I said, I think we all have really great work. We're really um, professional artists, we're strong artists. I think if we wanted to, we could make a really good proposal and submit it as a whole. And that's what we did. I'm 
for me to show work is super important. And so collaborating is also important. So I like to work with others. I like, but I also like to make my own work. And so no one said, oh, you have to do this or, you know, everyone went out on their own with the idea of the, the theme of the body as a vessel. So John, um, how did you fit in this group other than being the original inspiration for MV Moran to become an artist? Mm -hmm. uh, not being from this group of PNCA, um, how how did you fare in that? How did I how do how do I fit in with the rest of the group? What um, I well that's it's weird. I you know it's just it, um, and this is one of the, your work. Yeah, well it it, it kind of it, it, it's kind of like it feels like an extension of this whole last few years because I I really have no connection to them them except for Victoria or or anybody else. So I just feel like I'm just so isolated. So um, it it um, yeah so. I, I, I was looking forward to meeting all of the, uh, everyone and um, getting to know everybody. But er, since, er, since we even, almost immediately when this proposal was accepted, then everything closed down. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's, so. Yeah, so Brenda, you, you are in Ithaca, correct? No, or, I think that's um, Rhonda. I'm in, Pas uh, I'm in Pasadena, California. Pasadena, yeah. I would almost say same difference, but that's not true. Uh, <laughs> uh, so how was it for the two of you to be long distance uh, parts of a group of people who wanted to propose something so connected? Wow. Um, well, probably because of the circumstances of of the pandemic, we're probably not in too dissimilar a place that um, that John is is describing. Um, I think for me, it, this started by having a lot of conversations with Victoria and you know sharing work and and. Um, discussing some of these ideas and then um and then just sort of being in the studio making making our own work and then coming together every so often via zoom um i think probably the only challenge for me was to deliver the work <laughs> um and that was a long road trip up uh, up, up through northern california and oregon um, so it's, yeah, that's probably the only slight difference um, for me it, it, um, from working um, as more, more of a local artist um, like mm -hmm. some of the others here. Um, yeah. yeah. Rhonda, that must have been similar for you. Um, um, yeah, for sure. I think um, MV Moran is really the linchpin of the group, and and she always would remind me of what time it is there when it's and I'm on East Coast time. She's like, no, that's the wrong time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was just I, I think I've talked to um, you know her more through Zoom and text than maybe when we were you know classmates together in the same cohort. So. Um, I think Zoom has the ability to bring everybody together. Yeah, I'm sure they can use that as a slogan one day. But um, yeah, I mean, if it, I, I think she's the one that really brought this group together, and it's I, I think the work really um, gels well, um, and that I think that's only through her um, artistic insight into our work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about vessel. You know, the human body as a vessel and all its fragilities. And um, uh, Alana, I would love you to talk about um, what, what you think of the fragilities of the human body. This is uh, Alana's work, but I will move over to another piece that is a little bit more... 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, representative for the other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when I was making this work, um, I, my body has decided to kind of go haywire on me in the last um, three ish years. So I've been sort of on this journey to try to understand more about that. Um, and so I'm really drawn to um, physical work, repetitive work, um, because I feel like it's I'm I'm rendering something um, physically um, in this attempt to try to understand it. So um, I have fibromyalgia, and it's um, it's this very mysterious disease where um, it's really hard to figure out why things happen. Um, and so this, the making of the work is sort of the quest of trying to solve some puzzles. So, so would I be right in assuming that even if uh, MV Moran wouldn't have put this group together, you would still be working on the human body and its fr uh, fragilities? Yeah, that was actually happening before. So one of the first projects I did, I think it was the year before, uh, Victoria started at PNCA was um, I did a piece called Fantastic Voyage, which was um, a gigantic kind of cardboard fort sort of shaped like the human heart, roughly, um, with a lot of uh, red blood cell and white platelet pillows that are actually in there's a piece in the back that has um, similar pillows. Um, and then another piece that was the stomach. And there was some audio tracks that went with it that was my own voice kind of making heart noises and stomach noises um and yeah and and that piece kind of went on to i had a show at the, the portland building um that was just the heart piece uh and even my other work that there, a lot of my work just kind of deals with either the body or the mind or the or the connection between the two so it's definitely a theme that has run through my work for a long time. Yeah, I, I can imagine in uh, your circumstance that that would be um, a very logical kind of a thing. But MV Moran, um, could you say something about what attracts you so much in the uh, human body and your eight feet tall charcoal drawings which are um quite impressive and and big and stern sure so i think my slight obsession with the human body started when i was two when i found these barbie dolls back in the day these weren't really barbies but you see this photo of me and i'm just amazed at these barbies and i think everything i do is an extension of these barbies except i made them and, you know, so much bigger. I'm five foot one. I would kind of like to be a little bit taller. So I give my women, um, they're called the Bad Air Series. I give them a little bit more um, curves and, you know, I, I expand them in ways that I think take up space in which um, I'm really intrigued by. I'm, I'm always kind of amazed at how men take up space when you go into a subway or you go into to a, a room. And so I really wanted these women to take up space and to be seen. Uh, the older I get, I'm realizing that um, I'm becoming unseen. I'm getting into that age where, um, you know, I'm not as um, young and thin and, um, charming and so I'm kind of going into this unseen and so I wanted to kind of take these women and have them be completely seen. They're definitely seen Good. most certainly um, and I think uh, for our viewers uh, your work is is the most obvious. Yeah. Your and Alana's work are the most obvious uh, of this is about the human body but Brenda could you tell us how you are translate this is not working very well but people will have to come in person and see this uh, brenda could you talk about how you translate this idea of the human body and um it's all of its fragility i keep getting back to the fragility because uh that is mm -hmm. a, 
um, a personal experience for, for me, and I won't go into that. But um, could you tell us a little yeah. bit? That's a personal experience for me too. Um, I, I've had a lot of um, more kind of skeletal <laughs> issues uh, in fairly recent years, not, um, this was, I'm looking back at about five or six years ago, um, having some back issues and knee problems and just realizing that, that, um, that my body was changing um, as I was getting older. And um, I was thinking a lot about the sort of um, trying to come up with some connections between the body and as a structure, um, maybe a little bit different from, from the, the idea of the vessel, although I, th I think that's, that's really um, part of this as well. I love the idea of the vessel as something that contains something important. Um, but I was thinking more about um, making connections between between bodies and um, structures um, that that break down. Um, so and well, I'm going to point out this to the viewers. Here is uh, the outline of a body, and behind it, that slightly darker spot is. I would say the remnants of a mud building. Yeah. Um, so I was doing a lot of examining of landscapes kind of throughout the throughout the West. Um, I was doing a lot of road trips when I started this idea. And then actually this has been a way <laughs> to continue um, during the pandemic. Um, just get in the car and go and and look for, um, you know, interesting landscapes. Um, I found that particularly uh, mud structures, uh, mud brick structures, like adobe uh, buildings or ruins that you, you find throughout um, the Southwest seem to be something that, where I could see a lot of more feminine forms in them. Um, and so it felt like that was a good a good place to like almost literally weave together um, the, the form of the body yeah, and as the- As you've done here. Mm -hmm. um, again, on your on viewers on your screen, that might be hard to see. So you will have to come in person to really look at it. Um, so uh, John, when, we, when we're talking about uh, the human body and its fragilities, uh, and you're part of a group of women, and we do have different bodies, how, what is your, did that matter? Did, how did you respond to that? Uh, what did you focus on? Um, yeah, I th well, yeah, I, I mean, I was aware of, uh, of you know, uh, thinking about all of those things and not and also just in our while working on this in our um, there's all the um, um, problems in our society you know going on with the pandemic and then the um, other things all, all things that were going on politically everything you know that we're we're watching I was it, it made me think what um, does the body contain what is that that um, that thing that's that that we're talking about that's different from the body um, and so I guess that's what I was thinking about when I was working on this series um, mm. how to express that that and try to strip away some of those um, so do, do you feel um, you approached it less personally, but more societal, if that is work? I don't know if that's, I, I definitely wouldn't say that. I would just say that with all of those things from watch from the news and being isolated, all of those things were influencing me. So maybe making me more emotional about those. Um, so I would say it doesn't, I, I would, 
I would say that I was maybe more emotional about it. And, and mm -hmm. um, so these shapes are kind of just, I was just um, focusing on painting and that's just the way um, I like to um, work through those. So, so do I understand correctly that yours are maybe technique based because it's about painting? Well, I, I used, I definitely used the, um, painting technique that, that like to explore that. Um, but um, there is, there is the, that same narrative um, aspect to it that's all, that's running while I'm working too. So that's one, I'm always balancing those three aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rhonda, um, I think you are probably the most documentary uh, person or um, uh, photographer with with uh, your output for this particular show um, more you know these are real people uh, what we've seen up till now was was artist interpretations of mm -hmm bodies. Could you tell a little bit about um, how you approach? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I do have a, my background is in photojournalism and documentary photography. That's usually, those are the courses I teach as well. Um, so um, it's pretty natural for me to, to turn my lens towards a documentary mode or aspect with my artwork. Um, uh, the the photographs that your um, cameras pointed towards are of my parents who are um, aging um, dramatically. Um, um, every time I see them, they seem to increase by five years, and um, their memory is is failing them at this point. Um, so that that's the most recent work. I actually did those in early uh, December, and. Um, um, it was kind of a test for me to see, you know, if the lens would fail me too, if, you know, if, if what I'm seeing is, would be documented uh, via the camera and, um, and yeah, I sure do look like my parents, but um, <laughs> um, so that was probably the hardest thing to photograph. And, and some of the other works are very much um, me questioning, um, you know, this, Kind of sorrowful tension of our, our expectancy on this earth and our interaction with other beings. Um, so you'll see a lot of, um, you know, yeah, so animals and and some collected works that are appropriated, like this uh, old uh, late eighteen hundreds glass plate um, negatives, um, which are you know I think photography lends this huge aspect towards memory and. Um, and accuracy um, or the question of, is it accurate enough? So uh, yeah, so my work very much documentary um, and I, I enjoy straddling that, that field of, um, you know, art felt works and yeah. um, photojournalistic works. So what, what, what uh, if you are thinking uh, in photography, what's, what's your inspiration there? Um, I mean, uh, this is inspired by your own experience and your relationship with your parents, et cetera. But are there photographers that inspired you? Um, well, I think the given, because I'm from Virginia originally and I've met her several times over the years would be Sally Mann. Um, but I don't tend to work, look at work that is, I could you know, count on as similar to my work. Um, you know, I look at work that uh, I think, you know, are more associated press photographers and friends of mine and how they're documenting COVID and immigration and yeah. war. Um, I look at a lot of work um, that way, but I also look at, you know, what history has taught us. Um, you know, I look at Steichen and how he's used his lens and alternative processes to kind of convey um, what he saw and, and the rising of New York and things like that. So, I mean, I, I'm looking at a lot of different things. Um, yeah, so that would be more this period. Yeah, for sure. Like, this for is sure. a little bit older, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So I'm looking at everything. And, and I think that just, you know, I, get, I think probably uh, a lot of you that have taught courses can, to, can speak to that. You just can't um, focus on one aspect of your work that, especially if you're teaching, you're, you're looking at, you know, the histories of photography and how they've influenced your own craft. So yeah, I'm looking at everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to talk about technique a little bit. And so I wanted to look at this a little bit more up close. This is one of Alana's pieces. And uh, here we have clay ribs and a field of macrame. And so my uh, question to you is, how did you choose to do macrame as, as your main form of of a carrier for your expression, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I've always considered rope to be, um, for me, it, it relates to the body. And so um, when I was imagining this series, it was easy for me to imagine um, kind of catching these, um, these objects of the body up into these nets. So it's almost like a, the, the, the mesh of the body holding these pieces together. So that was sort of what I was thinking about when I was looking at it, um, is this like rope connection because it's, um, I, you know, you think about the, the muscle and sinew connecting parts together. I was sort of using rope um, in that way for this yeah. piece. So it's also important to you that you're using rope and not a, a much finer twine or you can do macrame with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I wanted to stick with uh, the the sort of natural color because I felt like it was uh, relating closest to the body. And I tend to go towards um, this white color um, representing bone or, um, yeah, and, and then also red for like internal um, organs. And the, the, um, the wood was collected from um, a close friend's um, farm. And through the storm last last year, through the ice storm, uh, there were just tons and tons of branches down. They have they have um, a, many acres of trees. So I went in and um, picked out the the branches, and then um, I peel the bark off and I I leave the I I um, I whittle them, but I leave them rough because I want to I want to show that uh, the vulnerability um, of the mm -hmm. um, of the wood. Um, so so yeah. the, the scale of your work is, is relatively large. Did that come out of the material or did you pick the material because you wanted to work on that scale? And I, I, I'm bringing up scale because size does matter. Yeah, yeah I want- And my... Moran could <laughs> attest. <to>. Yes, <laughs> yes. I want my work to be bigger than life. I, um, I want it to be gigantic. It would be bigger if I had the space to work. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of push to um, as big as I can physically make in whatever space I'm in. So if anybody has a warehouse that they're just wanting um, to just give away for free, I will gladly take it. <laughs> uh, so now that we're talking about scale, um, there, this, this little corner here shows, um, shows uh, MV Moran's huge scale, then John's tiny scale, because those are six individual pieces. And then uh, again, a large piece by Rhonda, which doesn't translate on, on the screen here. So people will have to come in person to see it because it's actually a quite beautiful piece with, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but um, uh, a bird in there. And I really recommend you come and, and see it in person. So John, how, how does scale play out for you? If I... Well, um, part of, big part of, of, of... So now you have both your average oh. sizes in there. Well, a big part of how I work is, is, is using the materials and working in a series. So 
um, I, I like to include and um, work on a number of small pieces so that I can just do more iterations um, and move, you know, keep on moving. And so um, a lar the larger paintings can, they, they sometimes will be painted, you know, layered and layered and the small paintings too, but it's faster with the small ones. So I can um, keep my energy level up when I do work that way. And I also think um, with having, um, when I'm doing a tight series like this, they're um, having a, a lot of small ones actually um, work together and help um, mm -hmm. push my, push the ideas a little further. I think it's interesting to see um, how practical um, uh, thoughts or, or considerations at times really make a difference. So Enfi Moran, are you starting these drawings this large or do you have, tell us a little bit about your process here. Sure, well, typically, um, someone takes photos of me. Um, for the Bad Air series, my husband and I went to Coos Bay and we went to Sunset Beach. And this work was specifically made for the Vaughn Gallery at the Coos Art Museum. So I, location's important. So I went to Coos, it was when the Oregon fires were just raging. Um, even at the coast, it was just this apocalyptic smoke that filled the air. We went to the beach, he took photos of me in this like very skimpy dress and folks, um, some folks don't understand artists. So they have some questions for me and I tried to be as kind as I could that I'm just modeling here. And that blew some minds, it was, it was really fun. Um, but I took in this idea of this toxic air and these photographs and the toxic atmosphere that we're living in with all the social unrest and, um, and all these horrible experiences that everyone was going through. And so I went back to the studio, I started drawing small sketches and then I get out really big paper and just start drawing on the wall. And I typically draw everything at least um, once as a large scale, almost nearly finished piece before I move on to the final um, panel. So everything I do has been done a couple of times just so I can get the proportions right. I can get um, the body language correct because charcoal is not very forgiving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Alana, do you, because uh, macrame is once it's not a pain to undo, um, do you plan and know what you're going to do? Uh, these were actually all impromptu. Um, I didn't plan out. I did have like some very rough sketches, but I was mostly just uh, letting the rope tell me what it needed to do. So the piece with the mirrors in it um, that's on the right. Um, that one's called Mirror Neurons. And um, that one was a really happy accident because the way I was creating the netting uh, was sort of spreading spreading the, the, um, the structure of it out. And so I was able to actually fold it in on itself. So it's, it's almost like it's hugging itself. There's like an internal piece and then um, these two external panels um, that cover it. So inside there's um, there's little kind of eye shape or teardrop shape mirrors um, that were, I used kind of a stained glass technique to um, cover them with copper and solder um, and hang them from the piece. So there's a bunch inside and then there's a few hanging on the outside. So it's the sort of bodily, it, it kind of became its own kind of bodily shape with like an interior and an exterior. Um, but yeah, with the macrame, it was really just, um, you know, looking at books or looking at YouTube and finding knots that I felt were um, were what I wanted. Like, so there's um, in the other neuron piece, there's some wrapped rope that's wrapped in the shape of circles. And then those kind of fed into this idea of like um, neural networks um, connecting. So yeah. Um, but very intuitive and um, um, only kind of partially planned out. 
I kind of started with the idea and then um, the piece kind of unfolded yeah. as I went. I've never heard uh, macrame described in such a interesting way. Um, and as a fine art medium, mm -hmm. my medium is, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I have these, I have macrame friends that are very purist macrame people. And I said, I'm worried that my macrame is going to look like macrame. And they said, how dare you? Of course it should look like macrame. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, now that we're talking about technique a little bit, um, uh, Rhonda, you, you mentioned that your uh, approach is relatively documentary, but I'm gonna try and see if I can get closer to uh, the biggest piece probably in the show and your biggest piece, which is here on the back and has some reflection in it, but um, could you tell us a little bit about this um, and describe it? Mm. Yeah, I, I started this series of um, even before I was a, went to graduate school at PNCA. Um, I started this series of, of looking at and documenting um, strangeness. And I, I lived in the bush in Alaska um, and there was a taxidermist. And I, I kind of hung around with those guys a little bit because they were, you know, they were doing some kind of crazy stuff. And um, I saw this, it's a goat head um, and it's curing, the glue is curing uh, underneath the bag. Um, yeah, and so, this here is, is reflection. Yes, that's, that's reflection. People, if, there's no way we can reproduce this piece for you on this particular screen. It's just impossible. Right. But go yeah. on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the older pieces in the show for me, um, but it's the, the catalyst for sure and the work that I do uh, surrounding um, the cheery subject of death and dying. <laughs> um, but it was just so compelling and I, I usually like to blow scale. Uh, I didn't want to make a print to the size of the goat. Um, uh, so, and it's this, it's also a conversation about the, what we choose as humans to collect and this trophy aspect. So, um, you know, I, I blew the scale, uh, as big a print as I could possibly make, um, that still defined, um, you know, what I was trying to, to capture with this, this, um, object now. Um, and the, the other piece in the show that's relatively dark, um, the, the beauty of, teaching right next to Cornell or, you know, I teach at Ithaca College, but I, I have access to Cornell's labs and they have a bird lab and they have uh, a lot of collections and um, those birds are actually part of the collection of Darwin's finches. So they gave me full access to, to photograph those birds. Um, so, you know, it's just about collecting and this trophy aspect and not adhering to scale. Um, you know, and, I don't know and, what our screen does to this. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes the picture much more interesting. <laughs> it's bizarre. Yeah. Uh, again, you have to come and this is um, when you see artwork in real life and artwork reproduced, there's just no, no, um, when we look at this, mm -hmm. that isn't here. Yeah. Uh, if you catch some blue, that is there. Mm -hmm. So this is a new piece. Mm -hmm. What what I wanted to to mention on the previous work with the goat, that this was um, your first impression when you see the work is that it's about crinkled paper, and so that is as how close you've come with your with your lens to, to this thing. It's just uh, uh, a very big photograph of mm -hmm. something relatively small. And again, uh, size matters. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I wanted to ask you a little bit. We've seen your collage, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about these 
this uh, series as well. Um, especially this work, vapor number two. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this series and what your approach was, how you... Yes. Yeah, um, so this, this series of four kind of um, evolved out of the color series, I think that's on the other side, um, yeah. where I, I was um, working with ways to combine um, bodies in these Adobe uh, structures. And um, I, separately, I, so I, I work a lot digitally um, and, and I also experiment a lot with alternative processes. Um, these are platinum palladium prints. So I had another kind of body of work that I was, that I was doing um, with this platinum um, palladium, these, this, these solutions of platinum and palladium. And, and it's a lot of um, just brushing on that, the emulsion onto paper and then exposing that with, with a negative. And um, normally, you know, I was kind of painting rectangles and, <laughs> and exposing um, my more traditional photographs. And I just started thinking about, um, I, I wanted to explore more negative spaces. Um, and so, and, and also explore different shapes that I could make with, with that solution. Um, so the process was, um, I would build a montage digitally and then print, print those out as digital negatives um, and then kind of map out, um, block out where I felt like I wanted the, the emulsion to, um, to be painted on a, on a sheet of paper, go into the dark room and, and paint that and then, um, and then contact the, the negatives with the, the emulsion and expose that to light. Um, so that's kind of the process that this, that specific piece um, that you mentioned, vapor number two. Um, there was I, I don't I don't know that I have any specific subject matter that I'm looking for in the in the shape. Um, I just I liked this idea of I, I was painting shapes and then seeing if I could kind of get some interesting drips um, happening with the with the emulsion and um, there was almost kind of a I don't know a butterfly effect that was happening with that one so um, I ended up trying to um, kind of the registration of where the the, the image and the um, and the the um, emulsion kind of came together was it was trying to kind of emphasize that a little bit. Mm. Um, I want to give you another overview of, of the gallery again. Um, uh, we're sort of coming close to trying to wrap this up. Um, MV Moran, is there something that you want to address uh, about this uh, exhibit as a group uh, results? Sure. I was really impressed when I showed up and I had to drop off the work a little bit later just because of the snow, but I was really impressed with the way that you curated the exhibition. Um, a lot of times when I, I've been part of a group show, they kind of clump the artist um, on one wall and another artist on the other wall. And so when you move the pieces around and you were curating it, I realized just how wonderful <laughs> this exhibit um, showed up because of your hard work and also thinking about space. But I also thought, wow, you know, um, 
for this many folks to actually make this work and for it to be in one space, I think it turned out really beautiful. Um, and the composition of the work around the space works really well. And um, I just want to thank you so much and thank everyone for being part of this. I didn't ask this for fishing for compliments, but- I'll Oh, no, you. no, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm just really excited that you moved us around, that we're not just like clustered in our own little isolated um, wall space. That was really, really refreshing because I feel like I've already been isolated enough this year. So I didn't think my work needed to be, <laughs> needed to be as well. So, so this is sort of my last question. Um, and it's to all of you, and one of you can answer first or not, or um, how much of an influence was this isolation uh, to you? Because it is my understanding that some of this work is really, really new. As Rhonda said, uh, she worked on this in December, uh, which was also the delivery month. So um, how much was COVID, isolation uh, of influence because artists always work in, on their own uh, in their studio. It's a lonely profession. So does anybody want to address that um, at all? I have a quick word. Um, I usually make work that is um, in an invitation to play um, and I don't feel comfortable inviting people to play together anymore. So uh, oh, yeah, wow. it became way more internalized and kind of self-reflexive than um, my work normally is, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody else? Uh, John, you mentioned that you haven't seen anybody uh, during these two years. and. Well, not except for my family. I think in some ways I was actually more, have more contact because, you know, we're all, we're here together and, um, and which is good because I like to, I, I kind of stick to a strict schedule for myself so that um, otherwise I, um, I can't get things done or I get depressed. So I, I just, um, um, but it was a little bit trickier now that, that since I had, you know, people here and, um, all kinds of stuff happening at the same time because I have my studio at the house. Um, but then why, you know, because I'm also less the, isolated. Because it turned, I, I turned into like making lunches for everybody. Um, also, I was the the IT guy, you know, <laughs> constantly fixing all. Well, so, uh, instead um, of being uh, more isolated, you were less isolated. Just yeah, with an, uh, yeah. just with, uh, my other people. Yeah. I was isolated from the art community. So that was, that was, that's very difficult because I like to get out and go. Um, and, and I also have, you know, have um, part of, um, we, I have art shows at the house. Like I'll have, I'll invite all lots of other artists to come and we'll put a, have a party at the house with everybody, you know, like a couple of times to two or three times a year, we'll have um, 10 artists come and just have a, a big party. But, you know, I haven't done that. And I don't, it seems like it, a long, so long ago. So I, yeah. I, it was, it was very difficult for, because I like to um, be in con um, contact with other artists. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> we've, we've uh, talked for more than uh, uh, I thought we would, should. And so I would like to thank you all for making art, for being artists, and Moran for pushing for this idea. It took the Art Center a long time from acceptance to actually seeing it. I'm very happy that we can show it with full opening hours, Tuesday through Saturday from noon to five. This exhibit will be up through February 9, and there will be a CA, uh, Corvallis Art Walk, um, on uh, January 20 from 4 to 8.